Thank you very much, Daniela. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm super happy to uh, uh, have our dear panelists with me um, and have my former co-founder from space, Frederick van Dus, um, introducing himself at the edge of the universe. Um, and uh, I also have an esteemed startup colleague in uh, Marjolein Helder. And uh, I'll allow yourself to say a, like a few minutes worth of uh, introduction of yourself in, in a second. And uh, then I'm very pleased to be able to um, uh, welcome uh, Thomas, the planning uh, director of Vienna. Um, I can see that he's, yes. Hello, Mr. Metreiter. And um, also uh, Matilde will be rounding off this panel. I can see it's close to perfect gender balance as well. That's well done. Um, and um, besides introducing yourself, I would like you to uh, answer the, the following question. What do you see as being the most important aspect of nature-based solutions in cities? And how do NBS affect our lives positively? Now I'll start from the back. So I'll start with uh, Mathilde, if you would please take the floor. Hi, Martin. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation uh, to talk in this panel. Um, I think, well, uh, in relationship to nature-based solutions and the most important aspect that they have in cities, um, for me and maybe for us at IAC, uh, this is related to the possibility of nature-based solutions to provide ecosystem services for our urban environment. Um, so looking at different ecosystem services such as life support, so from soil formation to the quality um, management, air quality management, uh, procurement, so how these can enable us to produce food, uh, drinking water, also raw materials um, in our urban environments, regulation, so of course climate control, um, but also purification and potentially enhancing pollination within our urban environments. And then finally, you know, cultural values, so working um, in integrating uh, different typologies of aesthetics within the urban environment, but also uh, the fundamental role that these uh, can play in terms of educational or recreational um, values for our, our communities. No? Um, I think in that sense, uh, this is exactly how or, you know, these nature based solutions can positively affect um, our environment. Um, so in some way, I think that the, the central role that they can play is to broaden our understanding of what are the types of values um, that we can engage with in our cities um, and create an economic, uh, sorry, a, an urban environment that goes beyond uh, sort of economic values and starts to speak also of environmental and social values uh, playing a central role. Um, of course, nature-based solutions can allow us to enhance the quality of our life. You know, plants make people happy and there's much research on that. Um, it's, it's very proven. Um, but they can also help us maybe mitigate some issues and, you know, reflecting a little bit maybe also, yes, <laughs> happy plants. <laughs> Uh, maybe reflecting also a little bit on, you know, like the recent past. So what's happened in the pandemic, I think it's also maybe underlined, you know, um, some sort of sensitive situations um, from mental health, but also understanding how we can control indoor air quality um, in relation to the spread of diseases. Um, but also, you know, like the general understanding that nature based solutions can have a positive impact on the quality of the spaces that we inhabit. Thank you, Matilda. That was a very thorough answer. I look forward to seeing what people will be able to add to that. Um, Mr. Metreiter, uh, would you please um, also give your, your take on uh, what does nature-based solution, what do they provide us and uh, why are they important? How do they affect our lives positively? Yes, uh, I think this is, a, this is a very good question because normally uh, we are talking, uh, when we talk about cities, cities cities for me cities, cities is efficiency and cities density and cities artificial so it's it's on on, a, on a, it's, it's primarily it's 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 the opposite of of nature based uh, but uh, after after thinking uh, some seconds we we see that uh, we need nature for basic quality basic qualities in a city uh, it, it 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 it's absolutely clear uh, we, we need uh, fresh water, we need uh, clean air in the city. 
uh, we need uh, public space, green spaces. And uh, so I think uh, the, the relevant aspect is, is a balanced situation in a city, a balanced situation between uh, density, urbanistic structures, uh, built up structures on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, uh, on, on a very uh, high quality level, uh, green spaces, public spaces. Uh, I said uh, some years ago, a smart city needs smart green. It's it must be a, a, an, an urbanistic green, and it's it's not the same uh, than the, the the green in in rural areas. Uh, this is one aspect uh, to that that uh, that 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 people can can have a, a healthier life in the city. So they need green, and I think this is one of the of the learnings of the pandemic situation. But I, I also think that uh, nature-based solutions uh, uh, we, we have to foster them in our whole process uh, of of creating new cities and then of creating. Uh, uh new new settlements uh it's 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 the the uh the idea of circular economy it's it's also the idea uh in in german we say schwammstadt uh, uh, i think sponge city uh use the the water in the city uh for cooling the city uh i think this is also a sort of a nature based solutions and and so uh i think that the 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 challenge for us in the next years or in the next 10 years is to balance the situation between the efficient city, the smart city, the dense city, and the need of the people and uh, for, for, for nature, because they have a need, need for, for, uh, for, for natural situations, and uh, uh, to, to tackle the, the challenge of climate change. Uh, to act with nature and not against nature, like uh, the concept of sponge city. Thank you very much. I will uh, proceed to uh, Marjolaine. And I'm, if people notice that I'm changing between my formal addressing and, and not, it's because I've met some of these uh, panelists and some of them, including Ms. Maitrisha, actually the only one I haven't met. So um, I hope you can pardon my, my change in formality. Um, Marjolaine, Marjolaine, sorry. That's okay. Well, thank you for um, for the time and the opportunity to add to this panel. Um, so just a little bit of background. So I'm an entrepreneur um, and at Planty, we produce electricity as live, with living plants as a new sustainable energy source and a typical nature-based solution. Now, um, I think the most important aspect of nature-based solutions is that they benefit both nature and humans. Uh, and I think that's a very important thing. And especially when you look at cities, uh, one of the things, um, so Matilda already gave a very extensive list on uh, what are all the functions of nature-based solutions and what they could add to cities. Um, at the same time, I think the most important thing that we're looking at in the coming years already is that cities are becoming places that are increasing under threat of extreme weather, extreme temperatures, extreme rainfall, and we need to mitigate that. Now, I think the most positive thing of nature-based solutions is that these are solutions that make use of multiple purposes on the same land. So when you have water retention areas in, for example, a park, that's a com combined function. And I think in densely populated areas, as cities are, that's one of the most important things we have to look at. How can we combine different functionalities on the same area, surface area, so that we use the surface area most efficiently, uh, as the previous speaker already indicated. And I think that's one of the things that we can achieve with nature-based solutions, uh, and one of the most positive things we can achieve. And I think another positive thing of nature-based solutions is that they help us to root back into nature to learn from nature um, how we can improve our lives and become happier and healthier persons, I think. Thank you. I think that's uh, that must be the, the key here, the pursuit of happiness. 
Um, Frederick, would you please give me your take on, on what does uh, nature-based solutions uh, bring to our lives? How do, do they positively affect us? Yes, I know you're in sure. space, but imagine you're on right. Earth. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in space and I did remember to bring a towel, as they say you have to. Um, so I would say, uh, of course, Matilda touched upon all of every single note that I have put down on paper. So uh, I'm, I've been trying to be, uh, be a good participant and, uh, and, and bring something additive um, to, to what's already been said. Um, and, and I think that the quality of life uh, and the improvement on, on quality of life is one of the key aspects. Um, as I'm an anthropologist by training, um, one of the first things that comes to mind is, is the paradigm of uh, culture versus nature where we as humans have always been trying to master nature in one, one way or another. Um, and, and that has led to what we in anthropology call a very cultured nature. Um, and I think what, what we are seeing with nature-based solutions and, and the uh, sort of uh, implementation and deployment of, of NBS is that we're, we're looking more and more at a natured culture. Uh, and, and I think that transition is, is quite interesting, both from an academic standpoint, but also from a business and design standpoint, that uh, when, when, when we're looking at a natured culture, instead of having a grid mapping of a city, when we're doing urban planning, like if you're looking at basically all Latin American cities that are designed after the colonization of the Americas, they are all in a grid, because that's something that's easy to understand. It's easy to put on a two-dimensional paper. Um, but, but if we were to, to mimic nature and, and be inspired by biomimicry, we, we could have much more efficient routes of transport. We could have different vehicles of transportation. We could have different shapes. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's where uh, we can get quite abstract and, and see tremendous improvements in, in quality of life if we allow for a nature culture. Thank you, Frederick. That actually leads me uh almost naturally to my first question for uh, Matilde. Um, as a leader of an architectural school and a specialist in urbanism, uh, how have you seen the macro trends, macro trends related to nature-based solution, uh, nature solutions change during the last five to 10 years? My tongue doesn't want to speak. Uh, <laughs> please take over. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, I feel bad for going first again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I realize now I didn't actually introduce myself, so I'm Matilde Marengo, I'm Head of Studies at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. I'm an architect uh, with a PhD in urbanism. Um, so I guess, um, you know, uh, in terms of the macro trends over the last five to ten years, um, I think that nature-based solutions are beginning to play a fundamental role in, in the green transition of urban environments. Um, and in that sense, I think that we've seen the emergence of a lot of policy and action documents over the past five to 10 years on like a global scale, um, national scales, uh, regional scales, and also local scales that really sort of push us in that direction. And, and nature-based solutions can in some way be the vehicle to actuate these. So, you know, we've got like the sustainable development goals, um, more recently the, the European Green Deal. Um, in, in the level of Barcelona, uh, a couple of years ago, there was the climate emergency declaration and a series of other action policies documents have have come out in 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 that sense um so so i think that their nature-based solutions can really play a fundamental role um in relation to what uh, all of uh, frederick Marjolaine and and thomas were saying so not like so in the way of creating sort of intelligent um green systems um responsive green systems understanding you know nature as a culture um but also you know understanding how um these these nature-based solutions can sort of be optimized to function in the limited space that we have in our urban environments um in terms of education i'm actually really lucky to be part of an institute which has since the beginning or since its founding had self-sufficiency as one of the central uh, pillars uh, in terms of agenda. Um, so in that sense, we've been using uh, nature-based solutions for many years now as one of the tools um, to be able to comply with our goal towards self-sufficiency. And, and we do this in terms of sort of like the development of educational programs, obviously, but also within our uh, self-sufficient laboratory in Valdara. So we have a campus that is prototyping self-sufficiency. 
Um, I think in a broader sense, also in terms of architectural education, um, the understanding of the responsibility of design um, and the, res the potential impact that design can have on our planet um, is becoming clearer and clearer. Um, and so on a broader scale, I think that, that this to some extent or the engagement of circular design protocols um, and also relating of course to nature-based solutions is being more and more uh, actively used within um, education or design education at the very least. Um, so we're looking at design uh, through the lens also of environment and society and how this can in reality empower uh, people who inhabit spaces to work towards in some way a performative habitat um, and I'm going to go back to the happy with uh, working towards a positive future, of course. Um, so that's that's my view on that. Thank you, Matilda. Um, skipping around the speaking um, ranks, I would say, uh, jumping over to Marjolein, from a startup point of view, uh, when we're now talking about developments, what would you like to share with the, the private and public sector that could make them change how they see NBS and maybe uh, implement NBS in a different degree or in a different way? So, well, when I look at the experience we've got as a company um, to like most of our uh, customers for specific projects and products are um, public sector uh, because we deliver projects and products that benefit the public space. So we combine plants with uh, electricity production for standalone devices could be IoT, could be lighting. So these are projects that are uh, relatively often um, are um, included in the in the public space. But what we encounter nine out of ten times is that budgets are divided over water, energy, green maintenance, installations. So we've got all these business units within the organization, both public and private sector the same, um, and the budgets for all their projects and business units are all divided. Now, the real life situation is that when we deliver a product or a project like ours, um, this is an integrated system that benefits green, water, energy, light. Um, so, Theoretically, we would have to get like a piece of the budget of each of the business units, which is practically impossible. So we have had situations where we were sent from one business unit to the other saying, well, maybe this is more water. No, maybe this is more green. So you should go to them. So and it should be the other way around. So if it not only fits your business unit or your specific project, but others as well, you should combine forces. And I think organizations, both public and private, need to be much more flexible with their budgets and with their um, procurement process in order to get um, integral solutions and multidisciplinary solutions like most nature-based solutions into their system. And that's a, that requires a system change for most organizations. So that's a difficult thing. But I think that would be the most important thing that would benefit um, nature-based solutions within cities. Thank you, Marjolein. I think that's a good segue to, to Mr. Matrida. Uh, how have you, from, from the public sector's point of view, uh, dealt with this issue of having different business units and, and where, where does a given solution fit? Um, Uh, you are, you have not unmuted yourself. So, uh, from the standpoint of a city, uh, we are uh, and uh, as as head of of urban planning, I'm I'm fighting the whole day for a holistic standpoint. And and uh, uh, as 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 uh, Marilyn uh, explained, uh, we have the problem that also in, in cities a lot of people are uh, sitting in the silos. And 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 uh, they have uh, a look to the world in a, like a world of silos, and then we are always talking to them. Hey, stop! Uh, we have to find holistic solutions. We have to combine the things uh, so we can create an, an added value. I will I will give you one example. Uh, 
if you one one another example for nature-based solutions in the in the field of energy, uh, with, when when I was young in the 70s, maybe I'm I'm one of the oldest here in this round. At the, at the beginning of the 70s, uh, we we had the, the first oil shock globally, and then we started uh, the 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 the, the uh, task of of saving energy. Yes, but today I would say, hey. It's not uh, saving energy. It's it's not the the topic because uh, come to Vienna in summer we have energy enough. We have a burning sun. It's 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 extreme hot in Vienna. So our problem is not to save energy. Our problem is to reduce CO2. But this is a bit different, and so uh, it's necessary to create uh, intelligent solutions <clears throat> to to use the energy we have to use it better. To use the sun in the city, and uh, and then uh, we can we can talk to the people, and we can uh, and and also to to our uh, public enterprise, for example, because uh, if we if we, uh, we 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 look to find a way uh, to bring out the gas uh, from the public sector from from the building sector in Vienna uh, for heating uh, the houses. But then you can see uh, our public enterprise has to create completely different business models than before. It's a completely different situation than before. But it's 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 uh, a situ uh, the the solution can create for the people in the future much more uh, convenience than before, because before we we heated the the the, the houses with gas, and in the future if we can create intelligent solutions. Uh, we can heat uh, the people in winter uh, with the sun and and with the with the with the heat from the ground, but we also can cool them in summer. So more convenience, but uh, and we are we are working with 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 the nature with nature based solutions with with the 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 sun, but we need uh, a bit more uh, of of using of our brain because we we need intelligent. Solutions and we we need uh, finding new business models and a bit more of of a, a, a holistic look uh, or of you uh, on the city. Thank you. Okay, I can I can hear this uh, recogni recognition of the, of the same problem seen from the other side. Maybe a small uh, transformation is needed culturally and organizationally. Um, yes. Thank you. Frederick, I know that you have you have successfully dealt with some pretty large corporations when it comes to having some of these uh, cross business unit solutions. Where did you see there was a? I mean, you both run into obstacles and had a good pathways through. Where have you seen it work, and and what made it work? That, that's a great question. Um, I, I think in general, when you're looking at uh, deploying technologies, corporates are are a great way to start because they typically have budgets uh, for prestige projects that can be uh, sort of uh, um, indicators of what you could call a, a social capital in a way, if they can show that they're um, sort of um, on top of the development of technologies and, and what's, uh, what's hot and trending. So, so typically uh, having uh, a technology like the one presented by Epiclay uh, present in a lobby where you welcome customers is is, is a good uh, sort of conversation starter when you bring customers into a corporate. However, the problems seem to arise where the moment you have a new technology and, and here basically all NBS solutions that, that, that we have talked about uh, fall into this category. Whenever you have a new technology and it has to pass through a procurement department, it will usually have a, a whole range of tech specifications that, that are very hard for the NBS to do, um, providers to live up to. So, so managing um, the expectations between a corporate procurement department and uh, an innovative SME, um, that, that, that's one of the key parts where I have seen um, very promising technologies failing even though they had the perfect value proposition for the, for the corporate, they were able to deliver something quite sustainable at a great price that would integrate well with the manufacturing equipment, et cetera. 
um, but but due to uh, to some failure to live up to uh, certain barrier properties or temperature requirements or, or whatever it may be, um, it ends up not being procured by the procurement department. So I, I think when when we're talking about that, there's there's also a need for corporates and for uh, for public um, entities to review their, their purchasing strategies and their purchasing politics, uh, policies in order to actually allow for more changing and less rigid uh, input from their procurement departments. So say you, you can uh, accept that uh, a bio-based material has some, uh, some variations in, in the coloring or in the texture or whatever kind of uh, quirks uh, and small uh, discrepancies in expression um, might, might be part of, of the solution. So what I've seen that actually works is to take the engineer from the developing side, pair them with the engineers from the corporate, make sure that you create a setting where they make friends um, and, and actually start co-creation. Because if, if you don't have that element of co-creation, it ends up being an us versus them uh, situation and and quite often the SME is not able to perform and to outperform the competitors that are providing something that is more stable and more comfortable to to purchase for the corporate. So so I'd say it's it's all about um, invoking trust uh, from the SME to the corporate and into the solution and and make them willing to actually take that chance because it 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 is a new area for for everyone. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Marjolein, I'll turn over to you. Uh, what has been your biggest success in, uh, in in trying to get such a solution through? I mean, where you might have felt that you hit a wall, but th then you, you found a way around it. How did it happen and what was it? Um, good question. Like in general, I think the fact that we're still around um, as a company is quite a big success. Um, it, it's typical uh, challenging for um, companies working in the nature-based solution space. Um, and when you talk about deep tech de um, development, which is what we do, it becomes even more complicated. Um, as Frederick already indicated, um, like these procurement processes are really, really difficult to, to get through. Uh, and I think our biggest success is related to that in a sense that um, we were discussing with one of the Dutch provinces uh, about a really big project, a development project, was a, a pilot project where we would install our technology in a um, peatland um, somewhere in the Dutch polder to generate start generating electricity along a road um, with the ultimate goal to use that, for example, for lighting or IoT applications. Um, but we were way ahead. Um, we were not at that point yet. We were still developing the technology and we had to do a pilot project in order to actually find out whether it was possible at all. Um, so we met a few people at the province and they were really enthusiastic. So they really wanted to do that. And then we came to this point where they basically said, well, we, we are interested. We want to have this technology. We are willing to invest, but we're not allowed. So um, that was a difficult situation uh, because we had found like a potential client uh, to start uh, trialing our technology on a very large scale for us at that point in time. Um, and it was something that we had really put a lot of effort in to prepare. Um, and then it was blocked by the, basically the structures that were in place. And um, there were one or two ambassadors, I would say, within the province itself that basically said, we don't care that this is not allowed the way our structures are now. We are going to find a way around it. And we put a lot of effort in it. And in the end, we managed actually to um, get the project uh, completed. And the, the way we basically organized it was that we started off with a subsidy, with a grant, because it was pre-commercial technology, we were piloting. So everyone within the, um, within the province and we as well, we thought that a subsidy would be the best way to go. 
and we just couldn't get it organized. And then we came to this point where the uh, where one of our ambassadors within the province said, well, you know what? Forget about the subsidy. We'll just buy the stuff. It's physical stuff. It's an installation. We'll buy it. We'll become a launching customer. And we don't care what the power output is. We don't care about the result. We just want to go to that point somewhere on the horizon. And the only way to get there is by buying this stuff, by investing in it right now. And that's what they did. And that's basically, um, so that happened at a moment where it was um, financially typically challenging, which is something you will occur as a startup quite regularly. Uh, but they saved us from bankruptcy at that time. So that was awesome. And um, well, that was already, uh, I think, seven years ago. So uh, yeah, big clap for them, for the province of South Holland. Um, let me call them by their name. Uh, because they actually saved us at that time. And I think it's really important to have ambassadors within specific organizations that truly believe that the thing that you're offering to them can benefit their organization or the society as a whole, and they want to invest in it, and they go really the extra mile to get that organized. And that's definitely what you need. And, well, I would say this is uh, one of our biggest successes, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. That makes me happy to hear. I and mean, uh, the uh, having started businesses myself, I, I know that feeling of being like 10 days or five days away from utter bankruptcy and losing everything. Um, so I'm so happy to hear that you, you made it back, bounced back. Um, I, I'd like to go over to uh, Mr. Thomas Matreiter, um and, and ask the question. Now that we're hearing about some of these these issues in, in getting NPS through, how uh, when you've done the smart city plan for or, and strategy for Vienna, to what extent have you included NBS and, and how have you made it easier for nature-based solutions to come through uh, in your planning? So I, I would say the 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 key element was uh, to establish a very clear strategy in the city of Vienna. It's a strategy of innovation. You have to know uh, in the city of Vienna, they are working more or less 60,000 people, yes, overall. And there it, there it, it is necessary that they know uh, stability is one value, but we now ask you for innovation. And if we, want, if we want to be successful in this very huge organization like the city of Vienna, if we want to be real successful, then you, it's, it's necessary that you have to be innovative. Yes. And so, uh, like Marilyn uh, uh, told us about her, her success uh, uh, and, and, and the, of the ambassadors in the, in the organization of the province, and, and we try to stimulate these ambassadors. In, in, in our in our city, because the, the idea of our smart city strategy is not uh, to make a very extreme, uh, precise roadmap and, and we on the top know everything, we don't know everything, but uh, we, we try to communicate with the people in the city of Vienna, what's our goal, okay? But now you have to fulfill it, it's up to you. We need your, your ideas. Uh, this is one part of the answer. A second part is uh, it's it's extreme relevant uh, for the for the people which are offering uh, nature based solutions for cities. Uh, they have also to analyze what's real the need of the client. Yes, and I think this is extreme relevant. They, they it's it's often. Uh, uh, I, I, I become uh, or I get offered some solutions where I say, sorry, but there is no need. I don't need it. It's not my problem. Maybe it's the problem from some other, some, some other guys. Uh, I, I can tell you a story. <laughs> it's years ago. There, a, a very big uh, a worldwide acting electronic uh, enterprise came to the city of Vienna and they told me, Yes, I have the solution for all your mobility problems. I said, oh, very interesting. You have the solution. Please tell it to me. Yes, our solution is uh, to, to add a sensor in each parking lot in Vienna. I said, hey, sorry, guy, this is, this is not my mobility problem. Maybe this is, uh, then this is your business problem. 
but you, you, you didn't understand our mobility uh, problems at all. So, uh, uh, and, and so uh, let me conclude it. On the one hand, uh, in a city, and, and, uh, and we tried to do it in, 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 with our smart city strategy, uh, to turn a city administration uh, very precise uh, to, to a, a, a innovative mindset. And on the other hand, we need uh, on the opposite of, of us uh, enterprises <clears throat> which which uh, analyzing precise our needs. Thank you. And um, now we're talking about uh, this ability to, to see needs and opportunities. Um, and I'd like to bring the word to Frederick. How do you, where do you see these investment gaps and opportunity uh, opportunities arise, and, and what should small companies keep in mind when they try to address those? Mm, that that's that's a big question, but but I do see that um, right now we're we're reaching very unsustainable uh, greenhouse gas uh, levels on on the planet uh, at large, and we do have policymakers and corporates that are pushing for a 200 euro um, per, per ton CO2 tax. Um, if that comes into effect, uh, I think there, it, it's quite reasonable to believe that there will be a massive business opportunity for anyone who can capture carbon or, or the greenhouse gases from air. Um, and and so far uh, in green innovation group we have mapped more than 6000 green technologies and incredibly few of them are actually focused on what we call uh, carbon capture storage and carbon capture utilization also uh, abbreviated to ccs and ccu um so so when when we're looking at um how nature solves the problem of having excess resources. Uh, I, I would say that, that we here have an engineering challenge that very few have found a good solution to paired with maybe the business opportunity of the century. If, if you're able to actually save a, a corporate 200 euro per ton CO2 they emit, that, that's going to be a lot of money for a lot of entities. Um, so, so I would say if, if I'm looking at now you're asking about what's the, what's the investment gap or where's the opportunity, I, I would say that that one is, is ripe for the taking. And if, if we're looking at a Danish context that we take the 25 biggest listed publicly traded companies um, and they all manage to hit and reach their sustainability targets um, on actually exercising their, their sustainability strategies, by the year 2050, we will be looking at a four uh, temperature degree by by the year 2100. Um, so um, yeah, we're we're quite off target. No, three degree. Sorry, three. Um, meaning that we're basically doubling the, uh, the the temperature rise that we can tolerate and that we have all uh, committed to uh, by the Paris Agreement. So. Um, so if, if we run, just run with the thought experiment that, that uh, actually capturing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere is, is going to be good business, um, then, then we are severely lacking investments in that area just for, uh, for providing a little bit more perspective in order to reach all of the sustainable development goals. It's estimated that we will need um, 13 trillion US dollars uh, in investment. That would be a one-off that would be enough to make us reach all the targets and all the sub targets um, and on an annual basis that's that's the same amount that we are using to subsidize uh, the oil industry on a global level every year so so you you, you could argue that uh, the way that we're distributing capital the way that we're distributing value if if we look at capital as as a lever of value and what's creating value uh, is quite skewed in in a wrong direction um, so, so I think when, when, when we're looking at the opportunities and the gaps, um, I, I think that policymakers are uh, to a very large degree not living up to the responsibility of, of doing what's best for everybody, but, but are actually doing what's, what's best for very few. Um, and, and, and that's, that's a problem and that's a huge opportunity, which also leads me to if, if you are a small company, 
what you can do is figure out how can you integrate into larger contexts? What can you do to uh, extend the circle of owners or extend the responsibility of the company and group together so you also get a sponge effect in the companies and you're less um, exposed to, um, to the volatility of running a small business where inherently you will get an order and then things are going well and you have growing pains, but you cannot really execute and everything because you don't have uh, the h and machinery to hire staff, hire people. Um, so, so you end up breaking your neck in growing pains uh, or you do not have any customers and then uh, you build up a cost base that, that is inherently unsustainable for you. So, so I think figuring ways of collaborating and distributing the load uh, on, on all different kinds of fronts where you're exposed as a small company uh, is also part of it. Um, and, and funnily enough, it's something that plays on all levels. Uh, it, it, it plays for us as citizens, uh, it works for us as institutions, it works for us as corporates. Um, but, but at the end of the day, when we're looking at it, we must reach drawdown. It, it's the single most important mission in the history of mankind. Um, so so just to consider that we're investing so little in something that is presenting such an objectively obvious business case is is quite baffling to me thank you patrick i'll go um to matilde who was previously scolding me for, uh, for giving her the word <laughs> too often in the beginning um hence i'm happy i hope you're happy to have I, had some was, moments of silence <laughs> i was saying it for everyone else it doesn't yeah, it's okay i'm just joking um now you're, you're hearing there's some there's some issues here in, in in both how the smes present themselves but also in in which opportunities they address as uh you're the big brain that will guide all the bigger brains of the future hopefully um how um how do you help them become better at presenting sustainable solutions to those who will buy them how do you uh, help them into how do you integrate nature-based solutions in your curriculums both for your, your teachers and your, your trainers your, your learners in a way where it it goes from drawing board to reality more often a lot of responsibility there martin <laughs> um look uh, from ix perspective um you know we engage with nature-based solutions in a variety of, of formats, you know, through research and development. So um, one uh, is obviously within like the research realm. So through research, EU research projects. So for example, the BUILDS project is one of these, um, different educational modules, um, but also uh, the development of professional projects um, and also sort of local fundings within the city of Barcelona. Um, and this basically allows us, you know, our staff, faculty and students to engage actively uh, with industries, uh, with other academic institutions, with community partners um, to be able to sort of contextualize and apply all of the, the research and development that we're doing in a real context, you know, to situate it in a real context um, and to make real change. And I think that this definitely is, is very important for us at IAC, you know, IAC, we, we want to sort of like um, make change or build the future, but do it today, no? Um, so we, as an approach to design practice, design through research or research by design. Um, so we do a lot of learning by doing, a lot of materializing our designs, a lot of testing. Um, and obviously it's the Institute for Advanced Architecture. So we use uh, advanced technologies, um, both for manufacturing, but also for simulating, uh, designing, um, to be able to really sort of ensure that there's a contextualization, um, but also that we're developing solutions that fit for the localized context. You know, uh, what Thomas was saying earlier, he was talking about the problem not being exactly his problem, um, but rather than making sort of generalized solutions, we have the possibility by working with advanced technologies to make customized solutions uh, for each of the contexts that we're going to work in. Um, I think that also uh, it's it's really important to sort of uh, work in a multi-scalar way, and so understanding um, and you know Frederick was talking about the the integration into a larger context in terms of businesses, um, but it's also important to understand that design has impacts on all different sorts of scales through digital and physical realms. Um, so working in a multi-scanner manner 
allows us in some way to, to be aware and understand the impacts of one scale on another um, or of one realm on another. Um, and of course, for us, it's super, super important to, to work in uh, multidisciplinary uh, ways. And again, you know, the BUILDS project is a great example of this. Um, so bringing together biologists, uh, economists and designers to be able to work together in the development um, of uh, intelligent nature-based solutions. Um, and, you know, Marjolaine was, was talking about that as well early, you know, this integrating the knowledge between disciplines. Um, and of course, for us as, as architects, um, you know, understanding how we can integrate these nature-based solutions within the architecture in itself, no? So not that it become a plug-in, um, but rather that it become also part of the architecture, part of the spatial design that we're working on. Um, so uh, in that sense, we as IAC, I would say we use advanced architecture um, to in some way create passive, um, but also performative environments um, that can allow us to control microclimates, but also ensure these multiple ecosystem services that we were talking about. Um, and we do this through sort of material research and development, morphological uh, research and development, and also design research and development. Um, and, you know, for us, it's really important to sort of go out into the real context, as I was saying. So uh, most of our projects are based on um, the sort of prototyping, but also actuation within the city of Barcelona. I have to say the city of Barcelona is a great place to be in that sense, because it's, it's a city that's really dedicated um, to sort of promoting and pushing for innovation. Um, and, and, you know, understanding what are the impacts of these processes that we've uh, developed and prototyped within the context, so within the environmental context, but also obviously within the social context. Um, so working closely with neighborhood associations um, and community groups to be able to sort of integrate them also within the process of design. Um, so I don't know, I hope that answers your question in some way. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, didn't give you an easy question either, uh, and I'm happy to pass the responsibility to you. It means I don't have it. It's great. Um, I, I'd like to ask, now you're talking about inspirations and um, how Barcelona has been, been very helpful here and, and going across different uh, subjects and also combining different uh, types of expertise. I'm, I'm a little curious from, from a public perspective. Um, Thomas, Matt Ryder, are you with us? Yes. Did, when, when, when you did your plan for, for Vienna, um, did you draw inspiration from specific country, uh, countries or cities? Um, or was it a pure moment of genius that uh, inspired you and, and from there you, you, you drew it, 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 it was a pure moment of genius. Absolutely. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm joking. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm, uh, we are always looking to other cities worldwide, absolutely. And uh, so Barcelona, for example, is one, one of, of, of the cities we, are, we, we try to learn from, or otherwise, uh, let's say Hamburg or, or, or Copenhagen or, or Amsterdam, Rotterdam. It's, I think it's, it's, it's always, uh, it's, they are often the same cities. And, and what's interesting, I think, uh, the, for us, the, the 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 specific moment was when when we learned uh, we need uh, real co co creation processes, co creation, yes, uh, to do it with the people, to do it. But it's it's not only the the citizen uh, involve, in, involvement; it's also the involvement of all relevant stakeholders uh, to realize what are the the resources in a city. And there are much more resources than only politics, only on the administration. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, that the, the smart thing of, of creating uh, such a plan. And there, for example, I give one example, Hamburg. For, uh, they have much more tradition in integrating uh, the people in their processes. Uh, Vienna, Vienna has has a long tradition. It's 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 it, as as a, a a capital of of the Habsburg monarchy, and uh, so it's it's very there's a, a tradition of 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 uh, I would say administration, and there's there's one one saying from from Joseph II two hundred years ago. He said everything for the people, but nothing with the people, and this is a bit part of our genetic code. 
And so we have to learn that it's extremely necessary to change this genetic code. And so uh, my answer is yes, we have to learn from, from a lot of other cities, from a lot of other countries, but, but not uh, first technical solutions. We have to, to learn uh, how to do the things, how to do the things better, how uh, uh, optimal processes, yes. And there we can learn a lot, for example, from the Netherlands, from the Scandinavian countries, but, but also uh, from Barcelona is, is one of our inspiration city. Thank you very much. Um, I'll grab this opportunity to talk a little bit about learning and I'll ask uh, Marjolein, we're about to run out of time. And uh, just the previous session, we had all, all the hopeful startups from, from the Build Solutions uh, program. What would be your number one uh, advice looking back at the, having uh, been close to the brink of destruction, made it bounce back? What would be your number one piece of advice to aspiring uh, entrepreneurs looking to go into the NBS space? Well, I was lucky enough to be able to, to get in contact with Epically in, um, when, when they were starting up. So um, that, was, that was really cool to do. Um, and my advice I gave to them at that point was believe in what you do. Don't let anyone else tell that it's not working. Um, and then I said what I would say to any startup, trust your gut feeling. So there is a good reason that something feels good to do and that you have sort of a hint that it must work one way or the other. And it's normally, if, the, if it feels that way, that is exactly what it is. It's the right thing to do. So even if, it, especially when it's intuitive, um, then go after that thing because that's what you wanna do. That's where your heart is and that's where your passion lies. And I think as long as you um, follow that, uh, you will get to that point where it becomes rational as well to follow that dream because the, the gut feeling is there for a reason. And, um, like, and that's probably why uh, nature-based solutions have a pretty difficult time to actually get food on the ground. Um, because all the processes within most companies and public sector are very rationalized. Whereas we have encountered so many times uh, potential customers and clients that said, well, this sounds too good to be true. I don't dare to believe that this is actually the case. So Frederick, to, to react um, just a little bit on what you said, like, Capturing carbon, you know how, how nature solves that, right? Plants grow, they capture CO2. So including green in cities is part of the solution. Like that's where, that's the low tech solution to add to the, to the CO2 problem. So the, the thing is we, we encountered people that said, well, listen, plants that capture carbon and produce energy. So we got a CO2 negative energy technology. That sounds too good to be true. I don't dare to believe it. I can't rationalize it. But if it's true what you're saying, this is what we need to do. And then you get to the point like, okay, if this is what we need to do and what we want to do, how do we get it organized? And if you're starting a company, as long as you believe that it can be done, you can bring that message across to others. If you stop believing that it can be done, it's the time to stop your company. Like that's the most important thing. So follow your passion and keep following your dream as long as you believe it can be done. Thank you very much for the inspiring, word, inspiring words, um, Marjolin. Um, now you address Frederick. I'll, I'll bounce, bounce on, uh, bounce on your ball and say, um, well, I know you love work towards an aim for carbon drawdown. How do you see nature-based solutions uh, play a role in, in that mission? I mean, you, you have the rationalist perspective of being on, on the edge of our planet. Yeah, for sure. And looking from the outside uh, at the blue marble, uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious when when we're looking at it, as as Marjolaine uh, accurately put it, 
plants are already doing this. this. This is how nature is solving the problem of excess resources. So the problem is, is to, to capture it, use it, store it, build something from it. Um, and, and right now we have just around 70% of all arable land on this planet is being used to, to grow feed for, uh, for animals that, that are um, used as a quite unsustainable food source. So we could also ask ourselves, could we, could we do something that builds more value uh, builds more soil, captures more carbon, stores more resources that that are then creating even more uh, resources for us in, in the in the long term. Um, and I think you are absolutely right, Marjolaine. And I think that when when um, when the IPCC is estimating the potential for for carbon sinks uh, in agriculture, um, I, I don't think that they're taking into consideration uh, what it will mean the moment we, we transition into more plant-based diets. And, and when we do that, the opportunity to have nature-based solutions that are deployed in cities, providing food for, for citizens, locally produced, locally sourced, uh, freshly harvested within 24 hours, um, I, I think that the, the, the reduction in carbon footprint is going to be absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, the moment we start um, producing plant-based food on-site locally, uh, eliminating the need for transport, eliminating the need for the natural destruction that we're doing right now. I believe that we are going to see a global sponge effect taking place when, when we stop overfishing the oceans. We're going to see the ocean as a sponge as well, uh, capturing quite a lot of greenhouse gases. We're going to see the potential of the plowed fields that, that right now just become uh, monocropped um, um, animal feed. Uh, will we'll actually have a tremendous potential to be incredibly productive ecosystems uh, that, that can provide us with all kinds of resources and materials. So, um, yeah, um, I, I think to, to make a very long story quite short, um, I, I think that the answer is already there. Uh, and I think the key to that is unlocking the resource that is uh, alternative land use uh, and nature-based nature solutions are in, pretty integral part of that solution. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, not to get too biblical, but I'll let the first be the last. And uh, Mathilde, if you can uh, foresee the future, look into a crystal ball of uh, uh, urbanism. How, what do you think will be the trend going forward uh, 10 to 20 years? Okay, um, yeah, I can do that. Um, okay, so I think that um, with the raise of uh, or the the rise in, in awareness um, let's say of of the global population um, in relation to challenges like climate change um, and others um, I would like to think <laughs> um, that uh, the trend will be towards the wider implementation of nature solutions so as as has been said now you know like nature already in some ways doing what we need to be done um, I think also like, and, and back to both, both I think Marjolaine and, and Frederick were talking about this idea of uh, integrating into the larger context. Um, hopefully this, this potential integration can be multiplied through like the, the evolution of educational formats, um, you know, the, the continued innovation in research and development um, and, and, you know, more platforms possibly to, to launch uh, a variety of solutions um, into sort of like accessible kind of conditions. And again, the BUILDS project, I think, is a great sort of, um, you know, example of this. Um, I think, you know, um, Andre Ulied uh, was talking a little bit earlier about uh, one of the biggest challenges that he was seeing for nature-based solutions was um, public acceptance. And I think, you know, Frederick had introduced the topic of co-creation and, and then it was a little bit discussed by everyone. Um, but I'd, I'd like to imagine that there'd be a larger uh, engagement on behalf of society as a whole um, within the development of processes of nature-based solutions. So from, you know, co-design, co-management, co-creation, um, to be able to in some way also potentially enhance the feeling of ownership on behalf of the community towards um, not only the issue, but also what we're doing about um, you know, facing some of these challenges. Um, and then I guess the last um, sort of hope, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about hopes, not, not you know, uh, 
Ex um, I don't I don't have a glass ball, but I hope that these things will will happen. Um, but I guess possibly a more democratized, um, you know, version potentially of nature based solutions. And I guess for, for us from IAC, you know, the fact that we're uh, home to Fab Lab Barcelona, um, but also we collaborate with a lot of like community collectives. Um, I think these could also be the vehicle to, to sort of like allow that to take place. Um, and in some way, maybe, you know, allow everyone to take an active role in the part of the process, maybe that they, they feel most comfortable in, um, you know, not everyone has to do everything, but it would be nice to, to think that everyone has a place at some point um, within this transition, um, you know, transition towards uh, resilient or green urban environments. And I guess, you know, last but not least, again, for us, this is a kind of an IAC perspective is, is this idea of, you know, understanding how we can also make these systems more intelligent potentially so a little bit back to what Thomas was saying in the beginning um you know the potentials of integrating advanced technologies which in themselves are being more and more democratized um that can facilitate for example the contextualization or how they respond to the client you know some of the issues that have come up today um how they can be produced or introduced into our cities um and also potentially looking at how these can enhance the the performance of the same nature-based solutions that they're working in um so i hope that's where we're going to go. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> <laughs> All for the hope and the love. <laughs> yeah, look, I have a sticker on my phone, power to the people. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm, I'm like 10 seconds away from being cut off by uh, our, our the, uh, hosts, the main hosts of the event. They have still stayed quiet, but uh, we are slightly above time, so yes, I'm just being told that in this exact moment. Um, I am so grateful that you could share your, share your insights. I hope the, the audience was just as grateful and entertained as I was. I look forward to uh, meeting you again and hearing from you. Um, but I will uh, pass the word back to probably Hannah, uh, Daniela. Daniela, I see. Good. And uh, say thank you. Live in peace, prosper. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. Thanks. It was a great discussion. <laughs> yeah, I will just give them give you a minute to uh, to unplug yourself. Uh, it was indeed a great discussion, uh, and uh, thanks a lot. First of all, thank you, Martin, for leading this discussion. Uh, for me, it was super interesting. Uh, to relax a little bit and to just uh, listen and, and enjoy the talk and enjoy the great points that you shared uh, with us here today. But also thanks, uh, thank to you, actually thank to, I'm thanking the panelists, it's 5 p.m. PM. I'm losing it a little bit now. Um, uh, it was super interesting. It was an honest and, 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 and I would say to the ground talk, which I really uh, enjoy. And I hope as Martin said that our att attendees uh, enjoyed it as well. And, um, I think that Martin mentioned a couple of times um, uh, in, in, uh, in the wrap up today, when we created urban jungle, when we wanted, when we, we were, when we were thinking about the urban jungle, the first day was a day about where we wanted to get inspired. The day one was the day for inspiration. And my honest opinion, uh, now listening to, uh, to, to the experts debate and after uh, this uh, whole day, I think that we can uh, successfully tick that off our list and be happy about the inspiration and thankful about the inspiration that we have received here today. Um, this last part will rather be short um, and I will just wrap it up and close it uh, and share a couple of things uh, with you here. Um, uh, before I actually uh, do a sneak peek into day two, um, I would like to share mine or ours main takeaways from today. Many of them were re-mentioned during the last session, uh, but somehow uh, day one of Urban Jungle uh, showed us all that there are really good initiatives and really good, uh, really good um, ideas uh, happening already around us in our very own environment, very closely to us, and we can connect to them. We can get closer to them. We can give them some sort of a support. But in order for them to breathe, to live, 
uh, and for some new uh, initiatives or ideas to uh, to come to the stage, uh, I would say that we need even more strong, stronger support from diverse stakeholders. I don't know how much uh, you remember. You probably do. We started with our uh, with the representatives of European Commission this morning, uh, and we talked about how do they see our work, how do they uh, are willing to support the, the work of the project, similar to the builds of the initiative, similar to the builds uh, in the future. And I would just say uh, that we jointly here uh, with them, uh, with us, with our colleagues, with our neighbors, with our peers, we need stronger bridges in order to, to, to create stronger impact. I would say that this is mine, one of mine takeaways, uh, takeaways from, from today. Um, what was also interesting for me today, I'm rather now pulling the, 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 the more general uh, takeaways, which I think that are important from, for the wrap up. Uh, on one hand, um, we had this lovely statement, uh, don't waste your time start immediately just if you have an idea uh don't be afraid to share your crazy idea and start immediately but on the other hand we have um, mentioned several times today the process itself of the implementation of growing of nurturing takes time and uh when you when you start when you launch it uh, be ready that um, uh, ideas um, um, similar to the ones that we have been listening to today actually take time to grow uh, and to and to grow to their full potential. Um, and uh, what I really liked, uh, and uh, those were uh, this this will be uh, the the final thing that I would share with you here in the in the content wrap up, and that is uh, our solutions are about people and uh, are for people, right? And we have to have that uh, in mind when thinking about the ideas and potential solutions uh, for, for our cities. And what I really liked from their last session, and thank you, Marilyn, I'm, I'm calling you by name here. Um, uh, sometimes the nature is too good to be true. Um, I really like this. And I think that this is uh, very nicely rounding up the, the wrap up of the day one. Uh, thank you for for your attention uh, today. Thank uh, thank you for the for the active participation. Thanks thanks for all the questions that you have been posing uh, here for your lovely interaction in.